Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live in sync with your cycle? Do you struggle with a negative mindset around your period? Are you wondering if it's possible to be feminist and anti-birth control? We're going to explore these questions and so much more in the Managing Your Fertility podcast, because this is about helping you live a whole and full life. I'm your host and guide, Bridget Busacker, joining you in this journey of exploration related to women's health care, feminism, and fertility awareness. Are you ready? Let's get started. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bridget. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I am thrilled to have you on and chatting more about your business, your mission, and the women that you're serving. So before we jump into my questions for you, let's do an introduction for everyone listening. Christina is first and foremost a wife and mother of four children, ages 11 to 2. She is also a fertility and cycle educator trained in the Boston cross-check method of natural family planning since 2013. Through her business, Pearl and Thistle, she equips Catholic families and parishes with resources to learn, appreciate, and support one another in reading the language of the body. Christina holds an undergraduate degree in philosophy and theology from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in theology from Harvard Divinity School. She is also a life professed member of the lay fraternities of St. Dominic. Christina, I'm so excited to get into this conversation with you. Can you tell us beyond this introduction that I read, just more about your story and how you became passionate about women's health and being in this space to equip Catholic families, parishes, women, young girls, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it really is just like the sum total of a lot of different life experiences that led me here. And it's funny that you ask about like my passion for women's health, because when I started doing natural family planning, I was really approaching it from just like the theology and ministerial standpoint that like, this is something that the church encourages couples to do for family planning and um, we need to offer support. And so I was just very passionate about being able to be somebody who could help couples because I had kind of experienced a lack of support in that area. And it really was not until I had already been teaching for, gosh, maybe five or six years when I finally had a client who was somebody I knew in college. And uh, she pointed out that I had started off bio pre-med and that I had gone to lots of medical ethics conferences and had a real passion for, for health and medical ethics. And she said, oh, it's like the perfect, you know, synergy between these two different interests with the biology and the medicine and then the theology and that was the first moment that I had actually thought about that. So <laughs> it took somebody else to point it out to me that this was a real kind of summation of a lot of my passions in, in this one ministry. So um, it was a very, very winding road that got me here for sure. That's awesome though, just to see that integration that, you know, even though you weren't seeing it, someone else is just like, oh, obviously this makes so much sense. <laughs> right. That you're that doing how it this? usually goes, right? That somebody else puts the pieces together for you and you say, oh, right. Got it's it. a gift. It's beautiful too. So tell us more about your business, Pearl and Thistle, and the ways in which you're taking this integration of, of your passion and your skill set and, and turning that into a business. Yeah. I mean, again, it was, I just kind of stumbled into a business, I think. So the first thing really was I had worked in parishes and in campus ministry for many years um, after graduation and beyond. And I really picked up NFP instruction. I, a hobby would be the wrong word, but as like a, a very small side gig where I would help out friends. And, um, you know, it really wasn't until I stopped being employed in these other places that I, I shifted my attention to saying, you know, how could I be more intentional about providing these resources? And that's when my eyes started to be open to all of these other sort of ancillary issues that are facing not just natural family planning instruction, but where my business has now taken some more turns is just, you know, being able to educate people in the church about what NFP is and why it's important and uh, what are the resources out there. And then by extension to kind of think about how we as a church can be intentional about really making this an aspect of Christian living um, that learning to understand and appreciate our bodies and what they tell us about ourselves and about God should be integral to our experience as, as sacramental Catholic Christians. Um, so that's really what's driving my ministry right now is trying to figure out how we can really just incorporate this rather than having NFP just be this kind of niche side thing. How do we actually incorporate it into our central understanding of, 
of where it fits with everything related to building a culture of life and learning to appreciate who we are as people, as creatures. That's so awesome. So who is it that you serve? What would you say your target audiences are in this space? I mean, because what you're, what you're describing, yeah. that's a lot of work. I mean, that's like beyond, that's like five full-time jobs, so, right. which is incredible. Yeah. But as you, you know, as we've, as we've talked about and you know very well, I mean, this is in the trenches hard work. And so it's awesome to see that you're growing your business, your ministry, and really solidifying what you're doing, what you're providing to make waves, which is huge. Yeah. So the people that I mostly interact with in my business are, are folks, they're, they're Catholics kind of of a certain persuasion. They, they're already convinced about natural family planning and the goods that it can bring. And everybody has their own reasons for, for seeing the good in natural family planning. Um, and I really just want to make sure that they have access to, to methods and to options that resonate with them, that they have good, wholesome options for educating their children in this language of the body and being able to serve their parishes. Um, so sometimes that means working directly with parish staff to try and just figure out what can we do for your parish with NFP. And sometimes um, it's also just working with lay people who are passionate about bringing this to their parish. So, uh, so that's really my niche. I would love to say that anybody who has a body is someone that I serve. Um, but again, <laughs> that would just be too big. <laughs> that would be too big. So why do you find it important to focus on pre-men are girls and, and mm. girls and parents, parents and guardians? Mm, yeah. So I have a, a cycle prep program, which is a parent and daughter education program about cycles and periods. And that really came from a lot of different things. One of them was my experience as a fourth grader in getting what I, in retrospect, can identify as very poor education about my body and about the, the menstrual cycle and periods. I could talk your ears off all day about that. Um, but I kind of thought growing up that maybe that was an isolated incident. I didn't realize until I started doing natural family planning work and, and working with couples that my experience was not that singular, that very few women grow up actually knowing what their body does and actually knowing what goes on in the menstrual cycle beyond, oh, you have a bleed every so often. Um, and so that's when I really became aware of this need to educate and empower our girls. And I see that as the first building block to really building up body literacy and, and helping people in the church appreciate the fullness of, of the language of the body. So you know, that's, that's where I think it really starts is being intentional with our programming for, for young girls. That's so awesome. I mean, I think I can totally relate to yours saying that, you know, your education was subpar. I mean, fortunately I had my mom to fill in those gaps, mm, but really when yeah. it came from an education standpoint and curriculum standpoint, there really wasn't anything going on. Even, you know, I was someone that was homeschooled uh, second through eighth grade and even in the, in the curriculum that my mom had chosen, I mean, she really had to fill in the gaps and thank God yeah. she knew and was charting herself and knew how to talk about it, you know, without necessarily having, you know, the resources like yours, I think she would have been signed up, ready to go. Let's do this <laughs> because we really had such limited opportunities, even within our archdiocese, there was one program and it, it was just like an afternoon tea and you learned about your body, but it was mm -hmm. in a way that it just didn't stick for me, you know? And I, so mm -hmm. my mom had to really keep hammering at home, you know, and explaining, especially when I got my cycle, like, okay, this is what's happening. This is your period. This is how your cycle works. Like, let's keep talking about it. But otherwise, you know, high school it was never talked about in health class. It was just, yeah. you know, and it was that one year, at least and how mine was structured. It was, you know, one year and there was nothing around how my body works. Well, of course we're with boys too. There, there wasn't like a sectioning out to say like, okay, let's have like an intensive unit to mm -hmm. at least like really focus on the ladies. I mean, nothing. Yeah. So I think it's fantastic that you're doing this. And I guess, you know, for you, was it through that realization and your own experience and talking with others that made you realize, okay, this is a huge gap. And this is like, this is a huge space where we could do, be doing so much more. Yeah. I think it was a, it was a very slow realization. Um, my eyes were very slowly opened to it, I think, because what happened kind of simultaneously was that I, I started having these conversations with clients. And that's the thing, when you're an NFP instructor, you, the common refrain is, oh, I wish somebody would have told me this before. 
oh, I wish somebody would have told me this before. And you say, yeah, yeah, okay. And it wasn't until I started talking with clients who had daughters who were saying, you know, do you know of anything that's out there that we can use to teach our daughters some of this stuff? So parents, I think, are, are awakening to this need even in their own children's lives at this point. And I acutely felt that because my daughters are kind of approaching that age. And so it was this kind of juxtaposition of, you know, realizing that my clients were expecting this as a need, that this was a big need in the universal church and in the world in general. And then just feeling like, oh yes, well, this is particularly pertinent for my family. So maybe I should do something. And that's kind of where it all came together. Did you build out the curriculum based on your own experience as a fertility and cycle educator and then just your own knowledge and understanding of theology of the body? Or what did that look like in building out a curriculum for young girls? Well, it was a lot of research um, just to say, how are other people who have done this education for young girls approaching it? And so I did actually learn a lot that there's, you know, there's a lot of difference in the way that people talk about cycles and the one that I really resonate with and that I advocate for so much is just kind of um, this body, body positive approach that in our language, we do need to be intentional when we're speaking with children um, about giving them some values and about giving them the correct language to think about all of these things that are happening with their bodies. And I saw that demonstrated really well in, in some of the literature that I found and in others, not so much. And so then it became important to me to say, well, not only how can I teach the science of the cycle, which is where my NFP training comes in, but how can I do this in a way that's going to be as positive an experience as possible for a young girl? And I, you know, a lot of it was just talking with other moms and almost trading war stories about navigating puberty and the things that we thought about our own bodies, um, revisiting those awkward places and saying, okay, what would I have needed to hear? Or what are some things that would have helped me? And so the curriculum was kind of built out with those, those two things in mind. How do we make it scientifically accurate for my NFP training? And then how do we reach these girls to really change the script around you know, how we speak and think about periods in general? Because I think that's the other big cultural piece that we really need to, to dive into. I want to touch a little bit more on the second point that you made, because with the, I think more conversation and push around body positivity and not a bad push by any means, but mm -hmm. just really trying to, I think, bring a light to saying, okay, how are we talking about our bodies as women? You know, we're so, I think we're so used to acknowledging that we speak very negatively about ourselves but yes. there isn't, we're not usually given the scripts and there isn't usually um, some type of action towards how do we change it? You know, it's like, okay, well, just stop saying it. It's like, and fill it with what, you know? And so to start right. at a younger age, especially around positivity, around cycles and periods, because so often, you know, culturally, historically, we're seeing that periods are gross, periods are nasty. This is very, you know, almost in a sense, in some cultures, it's, it's un unnatural, it's weird. And, and so that mm -hmm. has just, I think, and you can speak so much more to this, you know, that has really seeped into our way of thinking. And how does that really expand into other aspects of how we think about our bodies too, by oh, attacking yeah. something so core to who we are? Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's really toxic language that we use to, to speak about our bodies. And this would maybe take the conversation in a totally different trajectory, but you know, the message that we're also given by kind of modern medicine these days is really that, you know, our cycles, our periods, our ability to carry a pregnancy, like all of these things actually just interfere with our happiness and we should control them. We should be able to discard them if we want to. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot of harm done there when we start from the assumption that, that being a female is somehow not normative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, we could, we could just talk all day about this. Um, but even just the basic things about, you know, I was talking to one friend who said, you know, she grew up in a house and she had a brother and her mother taught her that you, you always have to be very discreet with your feminine hygiene products and make sure that you hide them in the trash can because you don't want your brother seeing because he'll get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And these sorts of things, you know, I think 
mom was trying to look out for the interests of both children and manage family harmony and all of that. But at the same time, you know, we shouldn't be taught that we have to hide a natural process that our body is doing and a healthy natural process that our body is doing because it's going to gross somebody out. Um, there, there's so much baggage there that uh, we, I can't even begin to unpack. And uh, so I think we can, we can provide better alternatives to how we, we think and speak to our girls about managing this very personal aspect of growing up. I really, I mean, I don't like it, but I do like the example that you gave <laughs> because I'm sure, you know, this isn't an uncommon experience for a lot of women, you know, whether it's, you know, you're at school and even if you're, you know, using bathrooms with other girls, it's like, Oh, I have my period, you know, especially around those times when you feel those changes happening and you're trying to figure mm-hmm. out, is this normal or not? Is this something I talk about with my girlfriends or not? And, you know, you're trying to gauge what's appropriate to say what's not. And in this space of exploration, we need a grounding. We need a good foundation and understanding who we are as women and what makes us women and, and, that, right. and that these aspects are, are good. Um, right. I'm, I'm really fascinated. I just want to tap a little bit more into this as, as far as education goes around respect of the body and talking about it, because I think that example you gave of, you know, with brothers in the house, you know, when you have Mm -hmm. daughters and sons and just language around how you talk about the body, because I often find in, and I'm stereotyping a little bit, but I, I think there's some truth in this, um, that in Christian Catholic circles, we, we can tend to go in the opposite direction and say, we can't say, um, words like cervical mucus or vagina or penis or things like that as a, mm. as a descriptor, um, because that somehow we need to say like, oh, your private parts that down there, we don't talk about it. Um, <laughs> and on the, you know, and, and on the other yeah, extreme, yeah. there are books that are published where it's like, you need to be loud and proud about this language and kids talking about it all the time. So then you have girls, yeah. you know, I, I had someone say to me once, oh yeah, my daughter asked, you know, at parties, like who in the room has a vagina? And I'm like, that's ringing alarm bells to me because that's not appropriate to be bringing that up at this mm-hmm. time, but it's also not bad that she anatomically knows her body, but place and time, like, you know, yes. how do, how do we navigate yes. and, and form young minds around body positivity, correct mm-hmm. language, but in a way that's reverent. Mm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, What comes to mind, gosh, I've never, I haven't articulated this. So let me give it a shot. What comes to mind when you're saying all this is, you know, a lot of debates around, let's just use the M word, modesty. Oh no. Um, (laughs) Don't, yeah, don't get me started. But, but the thing is that, you know, modesty is, is situational and it is cultural. And so, you know, all we can do is we can we can train ourselves to be aware of what is kind of situationally and culturally appropriate. That's a part of becoming a mature, prudent adult, right? But at the basis, we always have to keep in mind that the reason we care about being modest is because we value something, you know, that that we recognize that there's an inherent Mm -hmm. dignity to the thing that we are talking about. And we don't, we're not modest because we're ashamed. And I think that that's a big key piece that's missing in so many discussions is like, why, why do we even bother about modesty in the first place? It's because of dignity. It's because there is something of immeasurable value that we care about preserving. And so when we talk about our body parts and when we talk about what's going on in our cycles, I think there can definitely be some sort of like situational modesty that we can have, but in order to actually be prudent about, you know, when can we have these conversations? Where is it appropriate? What is appropriate to say? We first have to be firmly rooted in, well, what are we, what are we valuing and what are we protecting here? What are we safeguarding? And if girls don't understand the inherent value of their bodies, if they don't understand how beautiful and dignified their bodies are, then I don't think they'll have a very good frame of reference for understanding what we're talking about here with this, you know, just um, kind of this, the situational modesty of our language when it comes to these issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, I really like that because it's, it's challenging. I mean, as a whole, it's challenging, you know, how we're thinking about modesty and, and is it coming from a place of shame? You know, are we not saying 
anatomically correct terms because of shame, because Mm -hmm. we really have, and I think this is where it ties in with body positivity, you know, where we have a really negative viewpoint of our bodies, or we feel that this is something that, you know, there's goodness in having in that protection, like you said, in that safeguarding, but, you know, at the foundation, at its core, why are we safeguarding? Why are we protecting out of shame or because we see the worth and the value of our bodies and the importance of how we're made. And, and that protection comes from a place of reverencing and, and honoring our dignity and not from a place of total shame and embarrassment of how we're made and and the body parts that we have. Right. Um, And I, you know, I mean, like this is just skimming the surface (laughs) of a really (laughs) intense, um, I think at times it can be an intense topic or even place of debate, but I think it's really good to, start those conversations. And I think you did a, you know, you, you answered it beautifully. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it because I oh, think good. It, it's hard to figure out, you know, and, and for me as a new parent, I'm thinking, okay, what, what's the language I need to start using in our home? You know, like, what are we, and how are we describing our bodies and how we talk about them and reverence them in a way so that it's not so theological that my kid is looking at me, you know, at age of four or five going, what? Like, what? Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're saying, but also making sure that it's appropriate at her age level. And as she gets older, as she learns more, that it's not a total overwhelm. And so I think that really right. circling back to your program that you're offering, you know, involving parents and guardians in this role to make sure that they're, these kids aren't just getting slammed with information and don't know how to process it. I mean, you're really yes. trying to tailor this so that it truly is age appropriate so that a young girl isn't totally overwhelmed by the information and then it's coming out sideways for her as she thinks about it or it's feeding that negativity because what's around her is not positivity. Let's be honest, like we, right. are, we have to be really intentional about making change in culture and the way in which we talk about bodies starts with us and in this process with, you know, with your program too, really helping to rewire yes. for moms and parents, dads and guardians of these young girls for themselves too. So with your work in this, do you find that um, parents and guardians are, are pretty receptive in wanting this? Or do you find that there's some hesitation and nervousness even from them as well in the process of, of learning these topics? Um, I could see it as an aha moment and also a little bit terrified, like, oh my gosh, we're really doing this. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it totally is. And I, you know, I'm still learning. It, it's one of those curious things where, you know, if you work with a marketer, they'll say you need to know the pain points of your audience and you have to get this figured out. And um, I guess what's hard for me is that because I'm a natural family planning instructor and because I've spent a lot of kind of deep theological work uh, with theology of the body in the past, some of these things kind of came naturally to me when I was writing this text. Um, but since I've been providing this program for parents, what's been interesting to me is just just the realization that we should all have when we're doing our life's work, that like what comes naturally to us doesn't necessarily come naturally to other people and that it's a gift to be able to share that with other people. And so, so yes, I've noticed there's some hesitancy, but there's also a lot of relief <laughs> that I think we are all nervous about talking to our kids about these things because we don't want to screw it up because we understand that this is important. We understand that this is a crucial developmental moment. This is a sensitive learning period, however you want to say it. Um, and we really want to get it right. Um, and so I, I think I can see from parents that there's this initial hesitancy about like, do I even want to begin talking about this? How do I begin talking about it? And, and then kind of in this discovery of like, oh, there is a way to do it that will respect my values, that will help me and my daughter continue these conversations later on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to see the value <laughs> myself in this and just what it can do for, for parents who, who are hesitant and nervous as we, we all kind of are around this topic. Related to this, do you find any pushback or confusion from, you know, Mm -hmm. individuals, whether it's parents, you know, or churches or individuals who come across this program that they're, you know, thinking, oh no, this is not okay. You know, just again, it comes Mm -hmm. from that place of hesitancy or, you know, deep, (laughs) deep roots in shame or a more honestly, like purity culture mindset 
um, do you find that there's that pushback and confusion or do you find for the most part, people are pretty open to, to this because you're having that parent guardian involvement? Gosh, you know, there is a little bit of pushback. Um, you know, some people think that, that we really should not be talking about these things before periods, which I find curious. Um, that, that's some, some criticism that I've gotten is why, why are we pushing these conversations in elementary school when we should be waiting until our kids are old enough to understand? And I guess my response to that is, well, yeah, the science is complicated, but that just means that it's incumbent upon us to actually make the science understandable to an elementary school kid. Like, <laughs> um, we shouldn't put the topic off. We should just adjust how we're presenting it to meet the needs of the child. Um, so there's that. There's also just an aspect of parents who are coming from the place of like, they're the primary educators of their children and this is a sensitive topic. And so they don't, they don't want anybody else's voice involved in teaching their children. To which I would say, absolutely, that's great. If you are equipped to provide this education for your children, by all means, do it, do it yourself. And I love you for it. Um, but I think too often the problem there is that parents may kind of put their foot down and say, we're the primary educators. We're not going to let anybody else talk about this. And then they may not actually be equipped to provide substantial education on the topic. And so their daughters, you know, may not get what they actually need. So I don't know. There's, there's pushback from different areas. Um, but is it, is Chesterton who basically says like, if you get pushback from both sides, then that means you're in the middle and you're doing something right. Um, <laughs> So, so I'm just kind of clinging to that, that, um, you know, there, there is a niche for this and there are plenty of parents, I think, who, who just never had this for themselves and are looking for it for their daughters. And hopefully I can provide that and help them feel more comfortable in the process. Well, to me, it seems like it's a perfect hybrid for the parents who are thinking, no, I want to be the primary educator. I need to be a part of the conversations because I think there is a reality to that, that, yeah, absolutely. you know, if your child is in a classroom and you're thinking, I don't really know what they're talking about. And I'm hearing, unless I proactively reach out to the teacher and learn the curriculum, I'm, you know, maybe hearing it from my child, maybe not seeing what they understood or what they didn't understand. And the fact, and the fact that they have you to guide them and walk them through and they could go to you and say, okay, this makes sense, but, or I need to troubleshoot some questions. I mean, I think it's like the perfect setup because that has been something that I've, um, I have heard from parents, you know, just even conversations around natural family planning for daughters in high school. That was something that I had pitched yeah. when my sister was in high school, the youth group, just to say, Hey, could we just have a conversation around fertility awareness and charting and just benefits of doing this? And, um, the individual came back and said, you know, I think we're going to have parents push back on that. And I was like, well, moms can be there. Like this doesn't right. need to be something where I'm like taking your daughter away and talking about it. And it was still like, oh, I don't know. Like maybe that would be helpful. And it, mm -hmm. it just never really came together. But I think that was that big piece again, where it was like, well, parents are like, no, I want to be a part of this process. Yes. Um, so how do I do that? And I think it's so beautiful that you found that hybrid to say, yes, you need to be, let me help you to build the skills so that parents actually have the tools they need to speak to this and have the resources. Mm -hmm. And they're not having to come up with curriculum or handouts or language right. and saying, okay, let's work on this together. And right. in the process, your daughter can be educated. So she has the knowledge she needs to mm -hmm. make informed choices for her health, for her body. I mean, cause that's, I think that's another aspect to this, you know, women who are appropriately educated around their bodies and body positivity, I can only imagine good things coming from that mm. when it comes to relationships, when it comes to saying no, if you have a boyfriend pressuring you to have sex, when it comes to setting boundaries, because you understand your dignity. Like we've been talking about, you understand how your body works, what's going on and, and that your body is worth reverencing, like you're worth it. Yes. But absolutely. when you don't have those, those tools and the language, why say no? Why say yes? Beyond, oh, it's something that like sex is something you say for marriage. You, you know, it's like all those other pieces are missing. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but also how does your body work? What's going on? Like, you know, these other psychological and emotional aspects that really need to be addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where, that's where I think just focusing for me, you know, and this idea of, of helping people to read the language of their bodies, you know, that for girls, I see just kind of this basic self-awareness as the first step. So 
you know, for any parents who are wondering, you know, my cycle prep programs, we actually, we don't talk about sex. We don't talk about reproduction. We don't talk about fertility, really. Um, what I teach in cycle prep is the science of the menstrual cycle. And we talk about periods and we talk about how to assess if it's normal and healthy. And then, um, you know, kind of the, the moral component that I bring in at the end is basically because we have this information, you know, we're responsible for building up a culture of care for ourselves and for our friends. And so I talked to the girls then about, you know, how do you care for your changing body as you go through this cycle with its changing energy levels and your emotions? And then how do we extend that care to our friends and to our sisters and to the people around us? And so that's, I mean, cycle prep really is, it's not meant to be this like all encompassing holistic program of sexual morality or anything like that. But but it really is just kind of the bare bones building bricks um, for being able to then, when your daughter is older, say, okay, remember what we learned about our bodies and remember that we learned how to listen to our body, how to respect our body. And you can take those things and you can, you can go from there and talk about exactly what you were just talking about, you know, instilling these values and saying, okay, based off of what we know from just these biological facts, right? Um, Let's talk about how we respect ourselves. And I think it could be really powerful. It could be, could be powerful. I really like that clarification. Thank you for clarifying just the specifics of cycle prep and what it involves. And I, I love that because it's really still allowing, again, parents as the, as the formators and to step in and say, okay, yes. now we're ready to introduce, uh, you know, the topics of reproductive health and sex. Okay. Now we're ready to introduce topics around dating and you know mm -hmm. what does that look like and I think that's beautiful because before we do any of those things we need the foundation because otherwise right. it doesn't make sense it, you know it's in that same way you know, just my point earlier saying okay you know you're saving sex for marriage it's like for a girl who has no context or or awareness of how to tune into her body it's mm -hmm. like okay why it becomes very heady but it's like you want that head heart connection and you and and your physical connection to understand okay this is how my body is working and teach those skills at a young age of just being in tune with your body your emotions energy levels and starting to see what your body tells you in the data and how you can use that is mm -hmm. so powerful i mean that's something that i started learning you know and really tuning into it more in college and that was still like Yes, an earlier time frame for a lot of women, but you know, it was like, man, in some ways, I feel like I'm late to the game because this would have been helpful <laughs> when I had, right. you know, a couple, couple yeah. of menstrual periods down, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is exhausting, and I'm freaking out at my brothers, and they're looking at me like she's a monster. Something happened, and she became a monster, like, <laughs> you know. And so, just again, that language, you know, for parents to be able to navigate yeah. those spaces is just so powerful, mm -hmm. and and I again for for, especially for moms, for ourselves to, to maybe rewire, relearn. Oh yeah. My body is really amazing and it's really good. Yes. Yes. So this is a bigger, broader question, but do you think, do you think just with your work and, and the people that you work with and, and who you serve, do you think we'll see changes in our lifetime regarding women's health, especially when it comes to education Mm. and educating at younger ages like do you see a movement taking place um that's going beyond sex education in high school and middle school yeah I hope so um I've been really encouraged you know I think I think the thing is we we tend to think of movements and we we see cultural changes but there's always a sway back and forth and I think um you know what we're dealing with right now is just a knowledge gap that a lot of the women who are, are moms of girls entering in puberty right now, you know, we, we did not get a lot of this information. And more than that, we got, we got different information. We got information about periods and condoms. Like that was, that was like our fourth grade thing. And I was like, really? Okay, great. Um, and that's what we got. And so I think what we are seeing now is a bunch of moms who, know there's something better and want to provide that for their girls. And so what I hope happens is that we just shift these conversations and we give this next generation of girls really good education about their bodies and enable them to make some healthy choices. And then when they grow up, 
like imagine the things that they can do. Like if you if you have changed a societal assumption about the goodness of a woman's body, right? There's, I mean, I know this is a topic for you particularly, but like think about how much we can do in, in the areas of medicine when we stop taking the male body as normative. Think about how much we can do in, in medicine and even just in, you know, serving one another in society when our, our view has shifted. And I, I hope that that's what happens. I tend to be an optimist. There's a little bit of a pessimist rearing up in my gut right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could get on a soapbox and maybe talk about how society in general is lauding, like we're shifting period taboo conversations, uh, which I think is a good thing. But we're not even talking about the fact that the vast majority of women who are bleeding are not having periods. And that just boggles my mind that mm -hmm. like women who are on hormonal contraceptives, which is the norm for, you know, uh, for menstruating women at this point, like aren't actually menstruating. Like they're, they're just having hormonal bleeds and we're lauding them as periods. And I'm like, but that's not correct. It's not a period. Yeah. I know. That education, like a, that gap yeah. is totally missing for women. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. Totally so right. like, so yeah, like, okay, so let's, let's celebrate the fact that like, okay, let's, let's move conversations away from the taboo of bleeding. And then let's actually shift the conversation to be like, okay, it's, it's okay to have a real period bleed. Let's work yeah. with that. That's a different topic. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it's great. I mean, I think you're just pointing out that there are so many different areas that need to be addressed. And I just want to encourage someone listening if they're thinking, oh, what you're talking about, especially around, you know, normalizing periods and period bleeds. And they're thinking, I want to talk about this. I'm boggled too. do it. Talk yes. about it. Yes. We need more people in the ranks, in the trenches. It cannot be up to five people. I want to be able to have so <laughs> many people I can think of in this space that I don't have enough hands and toes and I don't know, other things that I could count with spoons, forks, utensils. Like I, right. I have so many people that I'm like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. There are so many in this space doing, because there are just what you're addressing so many different places that need, need people to step up and serve mm -hmm. and to share mm -hmm truth about women's bodies and men's bodies and just really yes. clarifying what the heck is going on and how do we you know transition into this space instead of being reactive to proactive care proactive yes. knowledge proactive understanding of the body in a way that is all encompassing and, and so much more integrative and i think it's beautiful to see you know your your business is growing so much and just to see you have such great content and an email list and so there's so many ways for individuals to get involved and connect with you and I, I will be sure to absolutely share these things in the show notes um just to have you know so many spaces that you're filling up and and sharing this message is huge it's awesome and I just hope that individuals listening to this are thinking if they're hearing about you for the first time they're like whoa I need this program <laughs> I'm gonna sign up right now because I think it's just so important and critical for ways in which we can make changes in healthcare for women, it, it's starting in our families. It's starting yeah. in the home. It's yes. starting with our daughters. It's starting with our nieces. It's starting, you know, with our friends and saying, Hey, you have little girls. You need to look at this and check this out. Like let's, let's be proactive in our communities, in our families and, and realizing that it starts in these spaces where we can really make cultural difference. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for saying that so much because yes, I think just my whole emphasis with the girls on building a culture of care and just this idea that we, we can make big cultural differences. And even, even thinking about the fact that, you know, um, my daughter has attended this cycle prep program with me um, and her friends from school, some of them have attended with their moms and have taken the course. And now I know that like when my daughter starts her period, she has other girls in her class, in her school who have received this commission to help care for her. So like as a mom, I also see this as an investment into like taking, taking care of my daughter <laughs> when she steps outside of the home that by surrounding her with other girls who have received the same education and the same commission and feel the same sense of responsibility and mutual care for one another, that I've created a tiny little culture of care for my daughter. Um, and I want to help other moms do that as well, because, it, you know, as moms, we just, we really want our kids to, to flourish and to be healthy and happy and safe. 
Um, and so it starts with us. It starts with the parents. It starts at home. You're entirely right. So what, just as a final question here, as we wrap up, what is your recommendation to a parent nervous about having these conversations, parent or guardian, who's nervous about having these conversations and, and where to start? Oh gosh. Well, first of all, uh, it's okay to be nervous. I think what's been kind of fun to see when I do information sessions and things for people is that they always, people always apologize for being nervous. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous about this. I'm, you know, and I'm like, that means you are a normal parent. Um, <laughs> so if you're feeling nervous about that, just own it uh, because it's a nerve wracking time. Like the teenage years, nobody wants to go through them. Um, so that's, that's fine. So lean into that. Um, and then I would say, you know, just, just start checking out some options. Cycle prep is my personal favorite. Um, but there are plenty of other options online for, for courses that you can look into. Find something that resonates with your values as a parent. I think that's really important that you find an educational program. If you're going to be sitting there and doing it with your daughter, make sure it's something that, that you like and that you feel comfortable with, um, because then you'll be able to carry that shared experience to future conversations. Um, and I guess that would be the second piece of advice is don't put pressure on yourself to have all the conversations all at once. I think we kind of steal ourselves sometimes for saying, okay, we're going to have the talk and we're going to talk about periods and we're going to talk about babies and we're going to talk about sex. And we're going to talk about all these things all at once. And our poor kids, their eyes are going to glaze over and it's, <laughs> it's not going to go all that well, but if we take it in bite-sized chunks, if we take our children's lead and really listen to the questions that they're asking, pay attention to the body changes that they're currently going through and answer those questions as they come, then I think it will be easier for us to navigate because we don't put the pressure all on one conversation, on one program, on you know one thing they heard at school. Um, the expectation is it's a lifelong conversation. And I think that is a lot easier to handle because lifelong conversations are built on relationships. And your relationship with your child is the most important thing. So just nourish that. That's so great, Christina. Thank you so much for being on today, for sharing your wisdom with us and expertise in this space and your why behind the work that you're doing. I think this is just so great, so important, and will really shed light to you know your business and, and helping women to understand the why for being more proactive when it comes to women's health, especially when it comes to young girls and their need for education at younger ages and how to do that in a way that really upholds and supports the dignity and worth of every woman. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and for taking the time to be with me today. This has been great. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for elevating all these different voices and bringing these conversations to the forefront because that's, it's really where it starts. It's just, you know, we start by thinking about these things and talking about these things, and then we can do these things. So, so thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And for all those listening, I will be sure to link Christina's work and, and what we've discussed today in the show notes. So you can check that out and definitely share with your friends and family who need this, who have daughters and you're thinking, oh, I know somebody who could use this. Great. Send it to them right now. <laughs> Again, Christina, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you, Bridget, so much. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and help expand the conversation around women's health. If you'd like to learn more about fertility awareness, visit www.managingyourfertility.com for more information, resources, guides, and so much more.